Hi guys, welcome to my talk. It's really amazing to see so many people here. Um, so you guys are ready to get into the dirty details of migrating legacy applications onto shiny new Kubernetes. Yeah? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I'm Joseph, I'm CTO and co-founder of QAware. It's, uh, we are a um, custom software development company from Germany, Munich, Germany, focusing on developing cloud-native um, applications, and migrating legacy um, applications onto a cloud-native stack. Um, and today I want to talk you through what we have learned by migrating hundreds of J2EE legacy systems onto Kubernetes. I'm the technical lead of this large-scale migration program at our, one of our customers. Um, it all started with a big bang when Kubernetes and Docker was released open source to mankind and literally everybody suddenly was available or was possible for them to develop cloud native applications. Um, those applications have common properties like uh, being hyperscalable, being res resilient to failures. Um, they maybe sometimes have or provide OPEX savings due to a higher resource utilization and um, more and more um, ops automation. And um, you can develop at a higher level of speed with shorter release cycles. So these are huge advantages of such um, cloud native applications. And the question is, what about legacy applications? Can they benefit from cloud native technology and get into these advantages. To answer these questions, I want, want to take you with me to the journey we had by answering this question for our customer. It all began with a brave decision of um, a major German insurance company CIO. He decided to move literally every web application onto a cloud native stack. Puh. And to make it a little bit more challenging, he also cancelled the contract for the existing um, data center. It was an on-premises data center. Yeah, um, the chief architect took over, eager to explore um, and learn how to migrate um, legacy applications, which are not microservice-y, which are not containerized and so on, onto a cloud-native platform. Um, but that needs time. So uh, the CIO was very generous and scheduled one year um, to finish the migration. I'll tell you afterwards how many applications and um, whether they proper their properties. So, but um, the CIO also raised some priorities for the migration project. The top priority is um, to increase the security level as it. Um, the uh, applications are um, migrated from a very trusted zone um, on-premises data center onto a potentially a little bit untrusted um, zone uh, public cloud infrastructure. And so security um, was a major concern. Shortly followed after um, time, um, it was important to hit this schedule in, to migrate those applications uh, within one year. And yeah, he also wants to save money and the migration cost shouldn't be that high. These were his um, priorities. So that's how we started eight months ago. So and today I can talk a little bit about this, what we have learned um, the last eight months and what will probably happen the next four months. Um, as Doubts are the death of each um, ambitious project. We also decided to be as brave as the decision itself. But uh, we also had some impediments uh, to overcome. Um, but we learned a lot. And so um, in the following slides, I want to present you um, what we've learned about the good, the bad, and the ugly of migrating legacy applications onto Kubernetes. Let's start with uh, the good things. Um, completely ignoring 
the principle of not putting the lowlights at the end. So I start with the highlights, the good things, and decre I will decrease a little bit um, further on. Um, by the way, this picture is proudly presented by the Bavarian Ministry of Economics, Tourism, and Beer. <laughs> so, um, what has been the good parts? First, um, the first task was to gain visibility. And um, yeah, the outcome was quite good because um, we started with a very naive approach. We wanted to architect the cloud. Yeah? We thought about um, the target architecture at first. Um, we thought about how to slice and mesh microservices. Um, we, we thought about how to package and distribute these microservices into containers and how to dynamically execute them on the cloud, the cloud native principles here. Um, but then it was a little bit clear that uh, we're not facing a greenfield approach. There are a lot of existing um, legacy applications and we knew nothing, quite nothing, yeah, uh, about those applications we had to migrate. So um, our first task was to gain visibility here. Um, we started by sending out uh, questionnaires to all relevant applications to gain first feedback on our fundamental questions like uh, what's the technology stack they use. Yeah? So for us it was important what images we should provide, what are the required resources and the required amount of resources um, to answer this question, how many application will be hard to schedule um, on, on Kubernetes nodes. Um, also very interesting part was um, those applications writing to storage writing to local storage or writing um, to remote storage, um, and the amount of data written there to decide what storage solutions we should provide, um, some special requirements like native libs or special hardware like printers or so, yeah, which is not virtualized typically in a Kubernetes environment. Um, and um, what inbound and outbound protocols are used, yeah, um, what's a protocol stack? Are they TCP level or are those uh, HTTP protocols? Are they secured by TLS? Do they use multicast, which is a little bit of a problem if you uh, use uh, plain vanilla Kubernetes, or do they use dynamic ports to communicate, which is also a little bit of a problem. Um, then we also ask um, concerning the ability to execute for the applications, are there any tests, are there any responsible persons, um, maybe are those um, applications running out of life um, during this year? Um, this was a very important question because only with this questions, uh, question 20% of the applications were away from our um, migration duty. Um, and last but not least, also important question, um, what client authentication um, mechanisms are used and should be ported onto our cloud solution. Um, but this was only the first step. Afterwards, uh, we have written a small code, a uh, small program called Cloudalyzer and extracted a lot of data sources um, which helped us um, to, to um, yeah, doing better decisions there. Um, those data sources were um, the questionnaires, uh, were uh, Jira tasks of the migration project, were um, an EAM tool, ap enterprise application management tool, um, were certain Excel sheets, and a very important source for our decision um, was uh, static analysis. Um, we performed static analysis on all application binaries um, with um, the IBM migration tool. You can see there which um, libraries are used and which JE APIs are used. Um, we used our own queue validator to check some dependencies and we used Sonar Cube uh, to have some quality metrics. And all this is integrated into um, something we called migration database, and we performed analytics on this 
database. We're using um, Tableau to explore the data there and to answer architectural questions. And we also have built a dashboard providing the projects and the management some basic migration information. That's the visibility part. Next good thing was um, our approach to do emergent design of the target software landscape. Um, because a big design upfront and analyzing each nitty gritty detail um, would have been very hard and time consuming. So we have to start with a little, with little knowledge and improve and improve. So we did an emergent design approach here. Um, we started with, by playing the divide and conquer game. We, we had to migrate 400 applications and we divided them into parts. One part are um, the more or less old applications of an age between 10 and 15 years. Um, all of those applications, by the way, J2E applications, and the more modern ones. And we decided uh, to migrate um, the older ones um, by an approach re-architecting them and making them runnable on um, Kubernetes on Amazon Web Services. And uh, the more modern application, we decided uh, to um, lift and shift them um, with their virtual machine from the existing data center into um, Amazon Web Service, into EC2 there. Why only those old applications at the first step to Kubernetes? Um, yeah, we wanted to do uh, risk front loading so we're doing the risky parts at the very beginning, um, and they benefit the most of re-architecting them. Uh, and those others, we put them at the first um, step um, while lift and shift on EC2, and the second step also will be to migrate them to Kubernetes. Yeah, after analyzing the migration database, we had a pretty clear view um, of uh, the source architecture um, we had to migrate. Uh, we're coming from 200 monolithic applications, uh, looking a little bit like this. Um, they had a broad range of backend systems and infrastructure systems integrated. They're using hosts, they're using batch processing, file shares, LDAPs, message queuing, all that. Um, the stack is based on Java um, 6, um, on a J2E 1.4 application server. They've built an almighty legacy framework um, on top of that, um, hosting the application and a basic HTTPD um, web layer. Um, the inbound traffic is TLS encrypted and um, this outbound traffic to the backend um, was mostly non-TLS, non-encrypted in, in those cases. So and we came together with the cloud operations team, we came together um, with the information security officers and designed a target architecture for all those monolithic applications. And the target architecture is about to run on Amazon Web Services, um, on a Kubernetes cluster. Actually, we were using OpenShift, but only the con um, container as a service parts, so it's pretty plain Kubernetes um, there. Um, it's based on Docker and um, JVM8, JE7, a lightweight application server. Um, we had to port this uh, my almighty framework. Yeah, we put it the legacy out, and now it's uh, almighty framework, next generation. And um, yeah, and then there is an important architecture decision up here um, to split the application into two parts, um, an outer layer part and an inner layer part. The outer layer part of the application um, is the part which provides um, user interfaces, external APIs, and for security reason also has to authenticate and, and authorize um, the users. And the inner layer application um, does all those 
business logic and backend integration things. And there is a, something like a firewall uh, in between. It's an API gateway. Um, and this API gateway checks those re requests from the outer layer into the inner layer if there is a, a valid token. Um, why valid token? Each and every communication here uh, throughout the stack um, should be um, TLS 1.2 two-way uh, encrypted and um, having an OpenID Connect identity token as payload. So you have your user context in this OpenID Connect identity token and you have your, your application context in um, the two-way TLS uh, client certificate and you have double layered protection uh, there. And the API gateway checks this OpenID Connect um, token. Yeah, and all inbound and all outbound traffic should be TLS 1.2. So now with a little bit of wizardry and some secret source, it should be easy to come from A to B, right? For all those applications. Um, for us, um, the fundamental um, decision up front was um, whether when we're migrating from A to B, B, should it be cloud friendly or should it be cloud native application on the right hand side here. And um, our decision was um, that B, our target architecture um, should only be cloud friendly. Yeah? Being containerized, of course, yeah? and we decided here to put the monolith into the container and um, should respect the 12 factor apps principles there. And this can be a f the first step if uh, some. Um, of those applications thriving towards cloud nativeness. Um, this is also the um, good first step, so. Um, but with our migration, we targeted um, cloud friendliness. So, um, but if we put the monolith into a container, um, what's running in this outer layer in our target architecture? Um, and our answer, um, and this answer has proven to be right, or one un potential right answer um, is um, to place an edge service um, on the outer layer. So um, we built an edge service, and this is uh, the application part residing in the outer layer, um, and the monolith is in the inner layer, and there is the API gateway in between. And the edge service is responsible um, to accept incoming requests, um, which, which have diverse user contexts. Uh, contexts. There are some user contexts, cookies set, headers set, uh, client certificates, all that. And um, the edge service then is responsible to change those diverse user contexts into an open ID um, identity token. And it uses a token provider, a central service here, um, which is integrated with all IAM um, systems and the customer, there are more than 10. And um, yeah, he can ex exchange, the edge service can exchange um, those diverse user contexts to an identity token. And he caches them, and if there is a request with no user context set, um, he is also responsible for redirecting the user to the single sign-on system to sign on. So with the S service in place, all um, authentication, authorization um, tasks are shifted into the outer layer, and the rest, the user interface, is still in the inner layer, yeah? of course, in, in our architecture, but um, provided by the edge service at the outer layer. Um, only a short glimpse into the internal structure of um, our edge service. It's based on Spring Boot and Netflix Sool, and um, yeah, basically is integrated with uh, the token provider here. Um, next thing is how to enhance our applications um, to respect 
the 12 factor apps principles or some of them and further architectural requirements um, on security like TLS 1.2 encryption all the way. Um, yeah, here we learn to love um, container patterns. Um, the basic ones are well described in the paper below by Brandon Burns and David Oppenheimer. Um, yeah, and uh, we used the sidecar pattern, uh, which enhances um, a container, an application container be behavior by a sidecar container in the same part. Um, we used this for log extraction and log reformatting um, based on FluentD, also for scheduling to trigger HTTP re requests um, on the applications um, for time scheduled tasks. We're using quartz there. Um, yeah, we used the ambassador pattern, um, which is more or less a proxy um, within the communication um, ranges. Um, we used it for TLS tunneling traffic when there is a neighbor system or a backend system not providing TLS encryption. Um, we used S tunnel or ghost tunnel there as ambassador pattern. Um, used it for circuit breaking and also for request monitoring based on Linkerd um, to enhance all those uh, features without changing the application itself. It was important to save time. And last but not least, the adapter pattern um, to, to provide um, a homogeneous um, interface of, of an application to the outer world. Um, we used it um, to yeah, to adapt um, the configuration uh, mechanism of this almighty legacy framework um, to Kubernetes config maps and secrets. So Kubernetes config maps and secrets were written to files and, and changed in the format um, and injected to the other container. The last good thing I want to mention is um, about Kubernetes constraints because initially we thought uh, we run into a lot of Kubernetes restrictions on our infrastructure uh, because those legacy systems behave strange. Um, like our target infrastructure didn't support multicasts. Uh, there were no overlay networks supporting this on play, in place. Also, we had no read-write any persistent volume, volume claims available, um, so we were, yeah a little bit scared um, to hit these restrictions. Um, and we did for quite a lot of those applications, but, um, but cutting these application requirements and um, re-architecting these applications not being dependent on um, multicast and not being dependent on read-write any persistent volume claims led to a better architecture of those applications. So we were okay with this, and it didn't produce that much effort to refactor the apps accordingly. So these were the good parts. Now let's get into the bad side of um, cloud migration life. And um, yeah, one bad side is state. State within the cloud. Yeah, sometimes microservices suggesting there is no state in applications, but there is state in applications, and in legacy applications, there is state in a lot of different representations. Um, the first representation um, is state within databases. Um, here, we made our life a little bit easier um, by letting those databases into, uh, in the on-premises data center. We didn't migrate databases to um, Amazon Web Services. They were still in the on-premises, or they're right now still in the on-premises um, data center, and we're using them from our monolith in the Amazon Cloud directly. Um, potential disadvantage here could be that there is um, more latency, but um, this wasn't a problem for us as the cloud interconnect in between Amazon Web Services and um, the on-premises data center was quite good. Yeah. There was nearly no 
um, latency impact there. But we had two advantages. Um, the application versions on-prem and in um, the new Cloud Native platform, they can run in parallel, which is very, uh, what is very, very good um, when you launch those applications, you can have um, smooth rollback to the old version. Um, and yeah, um, uh, this is also a privacy thing, yeah, as there are some, there's some data in those databases um, which should not be in a public cloud, at least according to German laws. <laughs> um, next state are files. Um, File persistent, uh, persistence um, was used in about 10% of those applications, and um, we restricted it very heavily. Um, so we didn't um, provide read-write any persistent volume claims. Um, we allowed no file writes into containers. Um, we um, yeah, uh, there was the rule that um, file, um, files within uh, persistent volume claims with application data, sensitive data, uh, they should be deleted after 15 minutes. And um, of course, there were no um, NAS mounts available from the on-premises data center into um, the Kubernetes platform. Um, so the migration tasks for the affected application were um, to store those files in the database as blob or um, use, uh, or use FTPS to store the, the files or to, to re-architect um, the application uh, not using files anymore. So now a very interesting part was how we tackle um, session state because all of those applications, nearly all of those applications had session state. First attempt was to use session stickiness. OpenShift somehow provides session stickiness, but in my opinion, in our opinion, um, in, in a cloud where everything fails all the time and is rescheduled every time, session persistence is not the way to go. Um, uh, session stickiness, sorry, is, is not the way to go. Um, Next step was um, we considered uh, about session persistence. Um, so writing session data um, of uh, the application in the existing application database, but uh, the performance impact um, here was high because there were many writes and many reads and uh, the application slowed down um, immensely. Um, Another try was using Redis as session persistence mechanism, um, but Redis didn't um, provide us with encryption out of the box. And um, also, we found nobody who wanted to run this separate Redis infrastructure required here. Um, so I got for a session synchronization, um, not using the application server mechanism here because um, this application server we used wasn't able to look up the peers within Kubernetes. So next try was uh, to use Hazelcast as in-memory data grid to synchronize session state, but um, Hazelcast costs a lot of money if you want to use um, TLS. Yeah, and session synchronization uh, with TLS and paying a six-digit amount of, of euros was not the way to go in our opinion. Um, so our final solution was um, Apache Ignite. We're using Apache Ignite right now to do session synchronization between those applications. You can hook it up into a JE server very easily. Um, Ap Apache Ignite provides peer lookup um, within Kubernetes yeah, automatically. Uh, peer lookup is a little bit cumbersome, um, but it works fine. Uh, and uh, yeah, this just for you to mention because this um, this was three or four engineering days uh, to fix this bug. Um, Ignite has a just-in-time compiler bug on the IBM JDK or JBM, so some classes have to be excluded there. We had to use the IBM JDK. Yeah. Yeah, this is about session persistence. So next thing is um, about diagnosability. 
Um, I don't, this guy is not relevant here, but I, I only want to uh, place the superhero of my, <laughs> my childhood uh, in some of my slides, okay? <laughs> so next, um, what's about diagnosability? Diagnosability is um, the ability to observe applications and to diagnose them in, if they're running in an abnormal state. And it's all about integrating traces, metrics, and events. Yeah, and our first solution was to go for Prometheus metrics, Fluent D, and the EFK stack uh, behind for uh, events and logs and um, open tracing implementations. Um, we used um, Sipkin, the first uh, step um, to, to analyze traces. But then we run into problems because um, we were not sure if we were able to set up a central solution that scales for all applications. Um, it, it's feasible, but um, we were not sure if we had enough time. And also, um, one instance of Prometheus, um, Sipkin, and Fluent, uh, Fluent D is, uh, or the EF Costec, um, per application um, was too much effort for the applications. So we decided to do an easy move, and um, now the whole cluster is instrumented by Dynatrace as application performance um, monitoring solution, but it's a placeholder for any commercial um, performance management tool, uh, which is pre-integrated with Kubernetes and, and suffers the needs here. Yeah? So we're not using those fancy cloud-native projects here, but it's instrumented with Dynatrace. So next is security. <laughs> Once again, my friend, um, we came far. We have edge service in place, TLS 1.2, two-way, and uh, those identity tokens all the way. Um, also security filters enhanced here at the edge service level. At the application level, we enhanced it, the application uh, by performing client certificate um, ACLs and token checks, and we have egress rules towards the backend to protect potential malicious containers for accessing all those backends. Um, but there is one thing remaining. Um, we had a huge problem with certificate management. Right now, three full-time employees are doing nothing more than scanning where certificates are not valid anymore or where is a new need for uh, certificates, issuing those cert certificates and yeah, <laughs> delivering those uh, certificates to be provisioned into the containers. And um, that's the current state, um, but we want those three full-time uh, employees doing something else by end of next year. So we're looking into um, solutions like Spire or uh, Istio for managing uh, certificate management on, on uh, the service mesh side or using um, network level policies um, based on products like Tigera or Cilium or, or Twistlock and Aqua um, to, to handle this application to application trust thing um, on the networking level. So, and finally, the ugly parts. Um, this line of code is um, very representative uh, for the ugly parts, uh, the hostus pocus, the host integration. We saw very um, ugly things there, how hosts are integrated and so on. It's mostly about cloud enabling cloud aliens um, there. We had toxic technology. This is uh, technology which is not supported and maintained anymore. And uh, especially it was our um, almighty legacy framework. Yeah? This almighty legacy framework was developed in the early 20, uh, 2000s, about 500 lines of, uh, 500,000 lines of code and zero test coverage. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but uh, we managed um, to, to, to uh, do all those migration tasks here we had to do. 
um, with our almighty legacy framework to make it an almighty framework, uh, legacy framework NG. Um, here, like uh, do, the migration to the new technology stack, um, token checks, token relays, um, or modify the configuration mechanism, um, and so on. And the strategies we applied was uh, yeah, the hard way. 70% of the migration was the hard way to migrate manually and increase coverage. Um, the other parts were decorate the applications with ambassadors, sidekicks, or sidecars and adapters. And um, in one or two cases, we decided to not migrate um, uh, certain APIs of um, the legacy framework and, yeah, having applications to, do, to migrate to another API. Yeah, that's the ugly side. So where are we now? Right now, about 100 systems are live on Target, on OpenShift, on Amazon Web Services, um, and a little bit less because 100 will be at the end of the year, yeah, but uh, right now it's 86 or so. Um, 200 systems will be live on target by end of first quarter 2018. And yeah, we're thinking this is, is possible because um, after yeah, doing some upfront uh, work, we're now um, launching tens of applications e uh, each week. And the other 200 systems will be migrated also um, by end of first quarter 2018 um, with this virtual lift and shift approach. And we'll uh, migrate them to Kubernetes um, by mid of 2019 or so. So, but we'll meet the requirement of our CIO that it's done within a year. So uh, that's what we've learned um, from our migration. Um, it's not a stupid just put monoliths into containers approach. Um, we tr really tried hard um, to come as close as possible to um, cloud-friendly application principles, 12 factors. And um, also, in our opinion, we increased the security levels really by an order of mag uh, magnitude um, at the target architecture. So that's all from my side. I think now the counter is at zero, but I can propose you I'll be out there um, for 50 minutes, for half an hour, and you can ask me any question you want. Thanks for your attention.